Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Oraculos True Divination Podcast, where I bring you ancient wisdom for the modern mystic. I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, and joining me today is astrologer extraordinaire, Judith Hill. Judith, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Michael, and this is a great joy and honor to be uh, on here with you, and I'm very impressed with your work. And I also uh, wanted to say with the audience, we all have something in common today during this corona <laughs> pandemic. No haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is absolutely, absolutely true. It, it's, it's quite an extraordinary period that we're in. But Judith, thank you so much for joining me. I, I really am grateful and honestly honored to have you here on the show because I have followed your work and I've known about your work for quite some time. And just before we even go into it, let me say that it was Lene Van Horn in San Francisco who introduced me to your name initially. So I definitely have to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Lene, for that because she spoke absolutely highly of you and I knew that we had to connect. And I know that you speak very highly of her. So yes. thank you, Lene. Thank you, Lene. <laughs> Most definitely. Now, now Judith, it is, it's such a pleasure to have you here because you are a, a world-renowned astrologer and you've done so much for the astrological community. And just even now, sitting with you, I've, I've learned some more. One, you are the author of 13 books, 12 of which is on astrology. You used to be the educational director for the NTGR in San Francisco for one year, but, but it, it's, it's, still, <laughs> it, it's, it's still a very big deal. And, and you've done so much amazing work, whether it's been research-based work or whether it's just been really statistical work on astrology, you've done amazing work. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've done in terms of astrology? Oh my, there's so many. You know, I, I began, I began uh, working in astrology at the age of 10 because my father taught me. He gave me a long apprenticeship and then I began doing uh, readings, paid readings at 14 and was on my own at 17 and did it ever since. So that, where should I begin? But I think <laughs> the thing that is most interesting is I spent 10 years in the statistical study of astrology with uh, working with some very, uh, with scientists and, and uh, astrological statisticians and non-astrological statisticians and critiques and examinations. And we did astro seismology Mm -hmm. a word I believe I coined, and astrogenetics. We did two major studies, one of all world earthquakes, and we produced, um, uh, you know, scientific papers, which we published worldwide. And I have, these are, you can, uh, I have a book called Astro Seismology, where all the papers are in, and another book called The Mars Redhead Files, <laughs> where <laughs> all those papers we published are, these are compendiums that you can obtain from me. Right. And, um, we did a lot of work uh, with, I worked with Mark Pollitt in, in uh, the San Francisco area and Jacqueline Thompson and a secret person at the U.S. Geological Survey. <laughs> and we actually, uh, we put in our very first prediction. We called the earthquake hotline. We wrote it down uh, for, the, for um, the 1989 quake we thought was coming in the Bay Area. We gave a fault line, the exact magnitude and the six month time window we thought it would occur and I moved out and it occurred. <laughs> that was the, the Loma Linda quake, our very first try. Anyway, I don't do that anymore because I don't have the time and right. you don't want to be sitting around hoping that your earthquake prediction will come true. It's very bad karma. So I just, you know, I just don't do it anymore. But we discovered an, an, a technique that would be very helpful if scientists would use it, but they won't. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. That's that's I I had no idea that that work was actually being done on such a large scale, and that you were one of the people at the forefront of that. So definitely kudos to you because what I think that we need more of in terms of astrology is we need more study. We need more more statistical study done in order to say that the things that we subscribe to 
or rather to say that the things that we actually practice can be proven in statistical ways and it has objective impacts on reality, not just the subjective study of the human personality, but it has objective impacts on reality. And I know that that's one of the main pieces for you within your own work, that you want to see excellence in astrology and that you also believe that astrology does have a place in the world at large. Can you, can you tell us about why that's so important for you? Well, astrology is the most remarkable uh, science. It's, it's a little microscope that looks not into, or a telescope that doesn't, not, doesn't look into the night sky. Instead, it looks into the hearts and minds of men and women. It can see into the human being uh, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, physically. Uh, it's especially useful in medical, and that's where I've put my my energy. Because above all, I feel astrologers should be useful, and astrology should be useful. So I love the vocational and medical uh, astrology, which is why I have the school of uh, the, the I call it the Renaissance School of Practical Astrology. <laughs> and uh, astrology is useful in so many ways for the psychologist, for the herbalist, for the what, why is my child acting like this? Um, it can be used, uh, oh, for breeding uh, llamas. I've helped a guy with that. Uh, it can be used for finding what is the herb a person needs. Uh, it has so many uses. But beyond that, it does what, what nothing else does. You know, no matter how good the doctors get, they do not yet have a method of looking into the pattern behind disease and the chart mm -hmm. shows this instantly they mm -hmm. might someday but astrology is already here why don't they use it right you know we have a right. we have we have so much prejudice against this field in the uh, western countries you know we're mm -hmm. still fighting it <laughs> yeah it, it, it's really incredible just the scope of your perspective of astrology's place within the world. Now, I know that you spoke about your work with medical astrology, which it's really, I, in my personal opinion, it's really up there on the list of things that an astrologer can do or should be able to do, because here we aren't speaking about subjective things anymore. We're speaking about what is actually going on within the physical, tangible reality of a person. Why did medical astrology speak to you so strongly or, or why were you so deeply drawn to that well as a as an adolescent i was mad crazy about herbs and i was also mad crazy about astrology and one day i realized that the uh in medieval and renaissance times even going back to ancient greece astrology and herbalism were paired so that became very interesting to me and also i i was always around a lot of skilled men uh, blue, my family was blue collar and we women were not being taught any skills. No one was teaching me a skill. So I wanted, I wanted to feel really uh, useful on the physical plane. And I started, so I started studying, uh, you know, vocational astrology because that was the thing I had was the astrology. And I started studying the medical and I found that it really, really worked. And so I, uh, I thought this is quite incredible and really should be brought back because it's been sort of buried and hidden, uh, but not entirely. Mm. And so I've spent, I'd say one of my life missions has been to bring that, that back and reinstate it to its former status. And this in fact is making some headway. I, I see so many uh, young uh, people graduating from nursing school, chiropractor, herbal schools, acupuncture schools, who are fascinated and incorporating some of the principles of what the ancients found, called medical astrology. We could also call it, you know, words are so important. If we called it cosmos biology, uh, <laughs> it sounds great. And people, all of a sudden the prejudice is away. What's that? And you say astrology and they just do this. <laughs> it's words are so important. So I, I would uh, love to invent some new words. <laughs> so so is it is it that you feel as if we need to bring back astrology as a word within its own right 
or do you do you feel as if it needs something invented around it that allows people to understand more of what the essence of astrology is? I would say both of those are true. Uh, the word astrology is a wonderful word, but if you say it, most people stop up their ears. You know, a, a lot of people, and, or they think that you're a, a devil, or you're doing devil's work, or you're you're a, a fraud or a nutcase. And in fact, it was so bad; it, it was illegal in 19, until 1989 in in California. Illegal. Oh. I had to practice secretly when I was your age. Um, people were being dragged off to jail. Uh, the it's the times have changed so much there's so much of a greater acceptance with the younger generation and many 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 scientific studies to prove that there is in fact um, planetary influence on our affairs but we do need some new language to interface with the broader culture uh, astrology does work by some unknown means we have a lot of good theories through planetary temperature, planetary speed, planetary moisture affects us from the, uh, apparently comes in through the chakras, if you believe in those, mm -hmm. influences our whole being, and somehow we're imprinted at birth with a fractal of the universal song the minute we're born. And this is, uh, this can be proven. Um, you know, I did take an exam where they had a the skeptics wanted us to match five biographies with five uh, charts. And we were just given a few facts of each life, their vocation, major health problem, a date of marriage, date of children, and a major operation and health problem. And three of us matched five biographies with five charts. This, you know, there are tests that can prove astrology works. I've, I've, I've um, made several, but nobody seems interested to, to carry them through, but they wouldn't be hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hopefully after this interview today and after some of the things that you and I have planned, it's going to make that more accessible for people and people will indeed show interest because, because you and I, we have quite a bit that we're working on together and we'll talk more about that as we move on. Now, Judith, a point that you made that I think is really important is that there can be statistical evidence to support the foundation upon which astrology is built. And the reason why that stands out in my mind is because I've recently been reading different articles by various astrologers that say, no, astrology cannot be measured in terms of the ways of measurement that we currently have or no, it just can't be measured because that is its nature as a mystical science. But here I hear you saying that there are ways in which we can measure and test astrology in a way that can stand up within any scientific context. Now, do you feel that that is still necessary for us to do, for us to be putting together the statistical evidence to support astrology? Or do you feel as if that's something that we've already done and now it's time for us to move on to something else. This is another excellent question. And there's, this is so subtle, so involved a question. There are already many, many statistical studies that have proven that astrology has some influence on our lives. They already exist. Uh, science is completely unbending, will not listen to them. So I feel the better approach would be dir a direct tests, but you would need a very advanced uh, astrologer who understood all this to carry them through. I'll give you an example. If you had a stack and you need to combine, I've learned with statistics, you need to combine two things, not just once. Uh, uh, the people who say it can't be measured statistically because every chart is different. They have a good point, but studies can be arranged to, to make up for that problem. Example, um, manic behavior, hyperactivity, manic behavior, rageaholism, and being very skinny are three traits that go together with too much Mars, uh, too much uh, male planets and male signs. Uh, whereas of uh, being phlegmatic, filled with water, highly depressed, pale, and um, timid go with an excess 
of water signs. So if you if you gave me a stack of, they would have to be signed off by doctors. Be very careful. If pre we pre-notarize the hypothesis. You get a stack of people who've, who, for the first 30 years of their life, for a long period, were uh, manic, were skinny, and were had were pro prone to behavioral issues and violent rages and athletic. We can name some traits. Versus um, overweight, highly depressed, and phlegmatic. And now. A very seasoned astrologer, they would have, you have to pick the people to do the test who have had a background with medical, a background with psychological, been engaged in reading charts 20 years. They take this test, not just any astrologer, that could be anybody. That's what they do with these tests, then they fail. And so the, um, then they declare astrology has no validity. Uh, and they also skew the test. They, they skew them through, I'll have to tell you how they, they cheat the, the skeptics who give astrologers tests. Astrologers always fall for this. Anyway, so you give, you give the seasoned astrologers these two packets of charts. And I would wager that they could match them 90%. You get, say, mm. 10 of each. They just sort them like, like you know, put the... The uh, red popsicles over here and the green popsicles over there. <laughs> they'd, they'd get it. They'd get it together. Uh, tests like that. Another test. Hope I'm not talking too long. Another test I would love to do, but I think any good uh, consulting astrologer could do this one. Mm -hmm. You're given. You're given um, either two charts and one person, or you're given mm -hmm. one chart and two people. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to share the same rising um, moon or, or sun. Right. They have to be born around the same time, so they don't look too different in age. The astrologer can sit as long as they want under the cameras, interview these people on any subject as long as they want, study them as long as they want, look at their, tr ask them about their different dates in the life, and then decide who whose chart is that, whose chart is that, or if they're doing two charts in one person. I'd, I'd rather have the two people and the one chart. Mm -hmm. Or two people and two charts and tell whose is who. <laughs> this is easy. Haven't you all had a, had some person who, you know, comes in and then they send their spouse in and, oh, oh, oh obvious, obvious who's who. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, now, again, the people taking this test would need to be, know their physiognomy, mm -hmm. know their uh, vocations, know their medical astrology. They have to be very experienced, well-educated astrologers and have 20 years in the consulting room. They could do this and they could prove it to science. <laughs> That's what we need, Michael. That's what we need. <laughs> I have, I have, every time we speak and we've, we've been connecting for, for, a, for a while now, every single time we speak, it's your passion about astrology that completely blows me away because what you're, what you're asking for, what you're demanding for and what you're saying is possible for us as an astrological community is to show beyond the shadow of a doubt the validity of astrology when put under the microscope and I, I've never actually heard you say this piece about how you think we can actually demonstrate testing of astrology but it's brilliant the the, the concept of it is absolutely brilliant now I continuously hear you saying that the astrologer who does this has to have a background in physiognomy and has to have a background in medical and vocational. Where do you think most of the astrological community falls within this framework of things that we need to know in order to be able to pass <laughs> these? <laughs> in order to be, it's a serious question. Where do you think most of the astrological community falls in order for us to be able to pass tests like these? Because let's face it, someone can be doing anything for 20 years, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be a good practitioner. You know, there, there are so many different ways into astrology as a body of information that someone can spend 20 years looking at the wrong thing. So, so what, so, so, so really, without using the time as a factor of using 20 years in the consulting room, what do you think we need to know just objectively? And where do you think we as the astrological community fall on the spectrum of things to know? Well, uh, you just ask the best questions. I think there's three questions in there. And you're, now you're going to make me unpopular. But uh, I, I ask of the people who would, yeah, now anybody taking a test for the media like this, 
represents the whole field. And, you know, you could, and this has happened in my day where they run around, astrologers failed the test and the test itself was skewed. I looked at that, but, and it goes, then it's in the media for years, still being parroted today. So um, you can't just be any astrologer. Now I would ask nothing less than what any medieval or Renaissance astrologer had to know. They all knew all these things. We now, what we do now is we have, astrology is a pie, let's put it this way. Astrology is a pie with many, many branches. And the old astrologers knew all the branches because they were the village sage. They had to do some medical, they had to do horary, they had to know many, many, many things. So now, we take one little tiny piece of the pie, like spiritual astrologers, one little piece of the pie. We learn that, hang out a shingle, we're now an astrologer. And we give it a whole field. Um, and that's astrology. Well, no, you know one little sliver of what I had to know. You know, I was trained by the people who still were in touch with the old, the old tradition. They're now all either deceased or about to go. And... Uh, so you asked where the spectrum was now. You know, I'm not, I'm such a recluse. I'm not that in touch with the spectrum, but I have a feeling that um, the majority of students are learning a, a psychological type of astrology that came into vogue in the 1970s and 80s after Michael Myers' book came out. It's, um, uh, they aren't learning uh, the old astrology. Now, I love Chris Brennan's work, Demetra George's work, Project Hindsight, Robert Schmidt's work, because they are preserving this very important root. And Matthew Wood, the great herbalist I so often work with, he knew Robert Schmidt very, very closely and had spent hours with him before he died. And apparently, the, the, they were becoming to the opinion that one of the uh, first reasons for inventing astrology was for medical purposes. Mm. That was one of its very first uses. There was an island, uh, I mean, there's the island of, of Kos or Kos mm -hmm. uh, in the fourth century. Barosis had his, his astrology school. At the same time, Hippocrates had his uh, medical school and their neighbors. This was all going on. So I would love to see the return of an energetic basis of astrology once you understand the planets as um, temperatures moisture vibration uh, feeling s slowness tightness looseness you then you see how the influence descends spiritually how it influences you psychologically it's the best system of psychology was astrology it predates and and informed young, he was an astrologer, and it's it's not the other way around. And <laughs> young studied astrology, and he, he has a famous saying of his. He said, uh, "What is it? An hour with the natal chart is equal to 19 sessions on the couch." And he came up with his four types: they're they're fire, earth, air, and water. <laughs> they're astrology. So as the science of psychology developed, um, it left a lot out. Uh, astrology recognizes in some some of its branches reincarnation uh, the influence of the planets directly uh, medical astrology influenced directly uh, so in a sense psychology came after astrology and brought many wonderful discoveries and a new packaging and new words and new terminologies and diagnoses and drugs and all that but it didn't give credit and astrology itself is really the most impressive form of psychology because it takes in the body, the soul, the spirit, the mind, all in one template known as the horoscope mm. or the natal chart or the radix. Mm. And so, I, but back to your question. Where do you think we are now in terms of the spectrum of what an astrologer needs to know in order to be able to participate in a, a test, if you will, or in order to participate in the sort of statistical study that you're speaking about. And you had mentioned physiognomy and you had mentioned medical and vocational. So, so what are the, the levels or what are the tools within the astrologer's toolbox still related to astrology that they need in order to do what, you're, what it is you're proposing? 
Yes, uh, to do what I'm proposing, the you know the person or the few people who would be selected to do this would have an excellent knowledge of natal astrology, of how a person looks, called astrophysiognomy, how that relates to the chart. They would need to know something about uh, vocational astrology so they could choose who's who by career. That's largely how I did it in that test that, that we took. Um, they would need to know something about medical astrology so they could ask questions. Well, do, if one person says, well, I have an appendicitis, and the other one says, well, I belch too much, uh, then you can you can pull it apart and see who's who with the chart. Or, you know, I, my, I've had this problem, I've had that problem. So those ones, medical, vocational, natal, and good, good transit work, good, good transit work. You're not gonna need horary for these tests, for this mm -hmm. particular test. So I feel there's a big difference between being an astrologer and being a great astrologer. So astrologers need to decide what kind of, of astrology they wish to practice. Do they want to practice entertainment? Regaling clients with fun little, uh, you know, oh, I see that you like dachshunds. Oh, I do. And then they're all excited. But what does that do for them? Um, so, you know, do you want to be an entertainer? You know, if you go down to the library here in Portland, you go down to the library and you go into the uh, vocational sections and they have these big, 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 big cabinets and you, you find these two giant, huge books and you bring one over the table and you look up astrologer. Both books say entertainer. They're under entertainment. Wow. <laughs> so do you want to be an entertainer or do you want to be the stage of the village that can help people with many, many, many things. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be a spiritual astrologer answering spiritual and karmic questions? Do you not believe in reincarnation? You can still be an excellent astrologer, but what kind of astrologer do you want to be? I've spent my life trying to reinstate the dignity of the profession. And so I feel this is very important. Uh, that means when I get on stage, I, I dress as nice as is possible. Well, uh, I'm not much of a fashion plate, but <laughs> I do what I can. I try to be put on the best show I can. I, I try to have the best data I can because I'm representing everyone in this field. Mm. And, uh, you know, people out there think we're a bunch of idiots. <laughs> they, they do. And I mean, in the other side of the fence there, the other side of the fence, y'all know who I'm talking about. So, <laughs> you know, all my life, I, uh, when I was young, it was so bad. If you went to a party and someone said, what do you do? And you said, you're an astrologer. They'd either look at you like you just shot their grandmother or they'd laugh and walk away. One woman actually threw her head back in a party and announced in t totally loud voice, well, that's a disreputable career. The, the prejudice oh. was enormous. So us folks like me and Lene, you know, who practiced back in the day, uh, we had to have a lot of courage to go against mm. the tide. But now it's like, wow, this is cool. Everybody thinks this is really neat. <laughs> it's like we're not used to it. <laughs> but that was the truth. And uh, we formed organizations just to be around our own kind. Uh, you know, it was it was bad. It was bad. So uh, we could lose jobs, you know. Wow. that That's really, it, it's really interesting to hear about what astrology was like. Not that very long ago, especially being a millennial and entering a world or being born into a world where astrology still hasn't been reinstated to a place of great dignity within society at large is still largely considered to be a form of entertainment. However, you find more people who are willingly ready to have astrological conversations today than probably in your time. What I'm sensing is a, with the younger generation is a tremendous hunger for, you know, the meat or if you're vegetarian, uh, the cheese, but <laughs> vegan, uh, the sprouts. Um, there, there's a, there's a, <laughs> the, the, uh, all my friends are going vegan. Um, there, there's a hunger for the real deal and, uh, people want to know more, uh, in my day, there were, you know, five books. Now there's thousands of books. There is a difference there. So, you know, I sometimes just help people on which road to take with their education. What branch do they wish to specialize in? But this is a, a remarkably helpful and useful field. 
uh, if you take it seriously and you want to, uh, you know, go into it with a full heart. It's you influence your client, not just through the chart, but by who you are. And so not everybody should drive a car. Not everybody should be an astrologer. You know, I shouldn't drive. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, so you know, many people get into it and they find it, it just is too difficult and they get burned out and they, or it doesn't make enough money or whatever it is, and they, they leave. You know. But it takes, just like if you're a good surgeon, you need good hands. You need, right. you need certain skills. So I would say a, being an astronomer takes certain qualities as well. Right. And it's not for everybody. Definitely not. <laughs> I, re I remember when I started when I started to be mentored by you and when I started apprenticing with you, the very first thing that you asked me was, what type of astrologer do you want to be? And you gave me the list and you said, these are the <laughs> options. <laughs> and, and I remember my response to you was, I just wanted to be good. So take me where you think I need to be in order to be good. And we've touched on so many of these things that you're speaking about now. But I wonder from your perspective, you, you speak about today, we have so much more access to information than you did back in the day when there were five astrology books, <laughs> five on, on the market. So now that we have so much more information, thousands of astrology titles, if you go online and look up astrology book, you get inundated with the amount of books that are there. Why do you think that our approach to astrology possibly doesn't reflect our increase in astrological information? Because what, what, I, what I think you're, you're alluding to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but back in the day, the astrology was stronger. Do, do, do you think that's the case? Yes. I, my, my father uh, walked all day through San Francisco, or was it Seattle, when he was in his 20s, all day long to find one book on astrology. Because he said, this is the funniest thing, he said he knew an astrologer was going to be reborn to him and he would have to teach that person. This is when he was in his 20s, but he could find this one book. Now, what you're asking is very interesting. It's, we're, in a, we're in a position of releasing toddlers into the forest. <laughs> to go running wild they, there's millions of directions nobody knows what the good books are nobody knows well what should you study what kind of astrologer do you want to be what's your goal what is your specialty field there are many fields you could be an astro meteorologist and do weather uh you know there's many many fields um people seem to think there's just this sort of psychological thing and they don't really know what chart reading really is for or about and and then they just go running off into the forest of books and podcasts and everything ah, you know um so uh there should just be a course in what in how to how to do your steps what steps to take you know i love it that that people study uh there's some really good courses out there you know mm -hmm. there's certain people who are doing some right? they really studying the classical you cannot go wrong because that is our root mm. that is our root uh there's many, many people who've invented, you know, new schools of astrology, but study the root and uh, try to know what astrology really is and what it's for. I think what my, what my real question is, is why do you feel the astrology of yesterday was stronger and potentially even richer than the astrology of today? Oh, what a great question. Well, it first starts with the people. Uh, people in those days were generally more disciplined. You know, they had really good education. They knew how to write. Uh, look at the, war, the letters written by Civil War soldiers. I mean, I have to say, you get hold of a 1930s or 1950s astrological journal set, and every single article is at the highest possible quality you could ever imagine it would win an award now today. Every article. So they were better thinkers. They were more trained. They had trained memories. You had to memorize uh, poems when I was in school. They had trained memories. They were better at writing, clearer thinking. They were not exposed to constant distraction. So the, the focus of the mind. Now, astrologers do need, you know, to have a cone on their foreheads. This incredible focus of mind. One hand 
getting your uh, your celestial information one one mm. hand with your practical knowledge. So you need to be a very practical person with a mind as sharp as Judge Judy's on television. And then you need, you know, like a lawyer. And then you need uh, the psychic openness. This makes your best astrologer. So now we don't have a lot of discipline or direction. We also think we study one year and we're now an astrologer. Whoops. <laughs> I hate to form you. <laughs> when you have been reading charts and studying about five years, you're getting seasoned. When you've been 10 years in consulting, you will feel, oh, that's what she was talking about. <laughs> you then, you have, your, you have your spurs on now. When you're in the field 20 years, it's like, oh my God, this, this wisdom opens up. Mm. When you're in the field 30 years, another wisdom opens up. It keeps going, provided you are living a certain lifestyle. Now, here we go, where I'll get unpopular. Um, in India, I've heard it's an astrolog to be an astrologer is an eight year course at the university, followed by a four year apprenticeship. You're supposed to be celibate. You're supposed to be this vegetarian, whatever, very spiritual lifestyle. Well, that ain't happening in America. <laughs> nope. No. So, but I will say this, if a lifestyle is very disorderly if you're not in a position to assist or read other charts very well so at least strive for an orderly stable mind and life within your framework you don't have to be celibate you don't have to be vegan you don't have to be down at the temple doing pujas um though who's to say if those things might help but you need a good life. You need a good lifestyle. Right. You're, you know, so this is important if you want to become the highest level astrologer. Right. Again, there's all kinds of entertainment astrologers or you don't, that, this is not necessary. Mm. Um, so, but it does take more than one year of study. And it, it's important to get some depth, get some breadth, and also study some of the, the basics or classical methods. Now, Judith, the next question that I want to ask you is you've laid out a manifesto, <laughs> as it were, of what or rather of where astrology can move towards. Where do you think astrologers coming into the field today should start? And I'll, I'll tell you where this question comes from. Last night I was on Facebook and I saw someone asked a question that said what made you all decide to be professional astrologers and does it pay well basically so someone <laughs> someone someone checking <laughs> so someone testing the waters essentially to see hey you know should i become a professional astrologer and will i get paid more money and so what i really would like to know is where do you think young astrologers today should start or even anyone at any age where do you think the neophyte astrologer should start their studies of astrology what should be step one i would personally uh suggest that a young astrologer uh, take one of two roads take uh learn basic astrology from a neutral course from uh, american federation of astrologers inc or the national council of geocosmic research. I understand that that you, Michael, are third uh, certificate uh, mm -hmm. level, which is very high. And um, that's one reason I took Michael as my student. I knew he was serious. Uh, I would say do that before you get stuck on an independent school run by one person because you'll just have their personal hit viewpoint or religion and uh, or politics. You want a neutral basis or Get the old, if you don't want to do that, get the old books by Safariel, Raphael, um, get uh, the, the... Charles the, um, Barto. Yeah, all the old books. Alan Leo, these are good old books. Um, Llewellyn George. Uh, that's, you learn the basic astrology. Um, if you get feel like you really want to get into the depth of it, I would definitely... Uh, 
do a course where you study the the classical methods. Uh, does Chris Brennan have one? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for for classical astrology, mm -hmm. uh, Hellenistic astrology. This will be helpful in how you think, though not not necessary. You can get what you need from these old books. Um, the older writers. Um, from the 1800s, 1900s, did a very good job. Mm -hmm. uh, then, once the student has digested this material and uh, practiced it on a few uh, scores or hundreds <laughs> of charts, you get your practice. Mm -hmm. uh, then you broaden out a little. Then I would study uh, some vocational astrology, some medical astrology, some physical astrology, I've got a book, The Astrological Body Types, that you know, details how the planets play out in the physical form. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, quite useful, too. But um, you start, then you get, you get your breadth and you get your depth. You get your breadth, you get your depth. Very important. Once you do that, maybe you're in year two or three, you then decide, well, what field do I want to go into? Do I want, do I want to give uh, kind of spiritual readings? Do I want to give psychological readings? Do I want to do just really good natal readings? Now, natal is a whole art, and Michael, you might want to tell what we're about to do here pretty soon. <laughs> uh, we have a little plan up our sleeves to help <laughs> yes, with better do. natal, better natal reading. Um, yes, you do. get if you're going to be a natal reader, then be a dang good one. Don't just oh, I'm just going to be a natal reader now, and I hardly know anything. Um, no, you be a, you be a, <laughs> you be a good. And by the time you've developed depth and breadth you've developed a little wisdom. Um, you will find that it grows and grows. And it, you learn more about humanity. Now in India, as in here, I would suggest that a serious astrology student also study anthropology, different cultures. You're going to have all different kinds of clients, different religions. What do they believe? Uh, philosophy. Uh, you want to study some astronomy. You want to study some psychology. Always remembering that we came first. And um, what else? Uh, a little of anything else. Oh, this is important, Michael. All of my students must also have a physical world skill to keep them grounded. They've got to be a, I don't care if they're a cook. I don't care if they rub down the horses down at the stable. I don't care if they're a farmer. Um, one of my apprentices, is a, is an, he's a permaculturalist. Another's an acupuncturist. Um, some are, are chefs but to be glued to the physical world. And I may be talking too long on this question, but there's a great danger in constantly being an astrologer. Uh, you, you can get way off uh, celestial information, can mm -hmm. addle you. There's a reason that in some, uh, like the Jewish tradition, my mother's family are, are all Jews going way back. Uh, you aren't uh, to study these things till you're 40 because you aren't ready. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I agree with that or not because I was studying at 10. People are, some people are different. But um, you, it can, it takes, you can go crazy and get very mentally unbalanced being a, a full-on astrologer sitting on a computer all day. Mm -hmm. You need to have some real-world physical skills. Even being a good musician can help. And it's, in fact, it's very helpful. I'm a musician. So it's very, very helpful. Judith, what it seems like you're laying out is literally a curriculum of astrology. And we're going to get into that a little bit more later. But what I think is really important about what you said also is that you said that astrologers need to have a point of constant connection with the physical world we need to have a real world skill. And this takes me back to something that I heard in a lecture from Manly P. Hall, in which he was talking about the structure of apprenticeship and guild systems in the Renaissance and how every guildsman also had a physical, tangible, real world thing that they did. So not only was a shoemaker a shoemaker, but a shoemaker also was a musician or also was a pastor or also had some other real world activity that they did, not just the craft of making shoes. So I think that that's kind of where, where, where you're coming from, is it? Um, yes, it, exactly. Uh, it helps, I mean, this is, I'm laying out, I'm just answering your questions. This is my approach. I, 
And also, I, I was influenced very strongly by a Sufi teacher who made sure that his students all had very good real world skills. Uh, it helps you understand uh, the world different and your clients. Uh, you know, I might get a pig farmer and I have to talk pigs with him. I, I might get a banker. I might have to talk banking with them. So the astrologer needs a great breadth and depth of world information as well as astrological information. Right. And when you're, I like to teach with four senses. If you're just teaching with a screen, you're not going to be a fully rounded astrologer. So you need to learn with your eyes, your ears, your nose, your taste buds, your hands, and it all helps you become a better astrologer. I do this in my course, Medical Astrology 101, where once they download, there's no more screens. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> they have to learn the old. They have to learn the old way, and they say it's a lot of fun. Uh, so, Judith, now let's talk about some courses because at this point, I'm very sure that our listeners want to know how can they study to become great astrologers and because that's essentially what you're charging us to be great astrologers now you and i have been working on a project and it's still in the oven it hasn't fully been baked yet but we're working on uh, on a project in order to bring this old information to people acknowledging that there are many roads to rome but really to give people the tools that they need in order to study natal astrology with profound depth, clarity, and insight. Can you tell us about that, please? Yes, uh, and those that are interested in this idea, because we're working on it, should, uh, mm -hmm. should let us know. So we'll either hurry it up, or we'll know how many to expect, and <laughs> you can contact Michael or me. Um, but we're hoping to have a course very shortly, uh, where uh, we read charts, we show the chart, and we do some, I show uh, how to get into reading a natal chart, how to really read a natal chart. This would be the, the basic course. You're to do all your own studies and homework, but uh, we it's be an active chart reading uh, clinic. Mm. And uh, there could be um, just natal, natal, natal. It could expand to medical, mm. to transits, uh, we can have sections for each, but we're thinking of just starting uh, really soon a um, uh, once or twice a month, a you know hour hour and a half, where we read charts online and uh, very interesting interesting cases that will involve every all well rounded everything I know. I'm just gonna you're gonna. There's two ways of learning actually. There's something important. Two ways of learning. One is to do all your footwork. I learn A, B, C. And you all should be doing that. But then there's, you learn from the outside in. You sit and watch the master at work. You know, that's how apprentices work. And you absorb how they're thinking. And this would be the approach to uh, these, these uh, online uh, monthly offerings. So let us know if this appeals to you. I don't know if we should give the name out yet, <laughs> Michael, or not. Well, 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 I was just going to ask whether or not we should, but I think that we should probably keep that under wraps until we finally have a date out, which is going to yep. be in the very near future. But yep. I am really thrilled and really excited to, and even honored to be doing this project with you because I think that what happened when you and I started connecting was that I realized primarily through the statistical work that you've done and also through the skeptics test that you did, that there's a really real and tangible place for astrology in the objective world. And yes. I mean, it, it's something that we know as astrologers, it's something that we know within ourselves because we practice it and we believe it and we, we take it for granted because we experience it every single day. But this, this charge to action, I think, to be great at what we do, great so that we can we can be put under the microscope and great so that we can really stand up and defend our astrology from the most advanced and the most masterful place within ourselves. I think that that is really the, the key that I get from being with you. And that's the thing that we're going to be giving to our students as well. 
So Judith, given everything that you've spoken to us about in terms of what it takes to be a great astrologer, if you look into the future, where do you think astrology can be if we take up this task of greatness and of excellence within our craft and we charge towards the future in a bold and a strong way? What do you think we as astrologers can offer the world at large? If we could get rid of this prejudice and your generation could do it, it's happening in medicine. We could have a astrological department in every hospital, helping set surgery dates, looking at proper dates for release, helping with fertility, uh, looking for um, you know proper treatments or, or diagnosis of strange problems. Uh, this should be in every hospital. And I'm not the only one who's dreamed of this. Uh, Dr. Cornell, he was an MD. He wrote that this was his dream too. And there could be um, psychological uh, departments with an astrolog astrologer on board. Uh, there could be um, setting uh, all kinds of dates. Like why, are, why don't they use astrology when they set off these, these uh, rockets to the moon? You know, they have to have a good launch date. Mm -hmm. I'm always amazed at how astrologers do not, I'm going to sit back, the sun is coming in. Mm -hmm. um, astrologers do not use uh, astrology for their own conferences and meetings. <laughs> Sometimes the aspects are horrible. It's like, <laughs> well, electional astrology is so important. It's the essence of astrology. So why aren't we astrologers ourselves using it? So we can see astrology can be so useful in the future if your generation michael will will really embrace it without all the prejudice that we were faced with it's it's such a it should be a social movement this is one of the great sciences of mankind mm. it really is and it's, it, it again has the greatest breadth and depth of almost any science mm -hmm. it can go anywhere you can do and you can do so many things with it so why aren't we using it right you know? Julia, thank you so much for being here. It's truly been a pleasure to have you here today, sharing all of your wisdom with us. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Michael. I, I really, really enjoyed this opportunity to, to share. Uh, it's just wonderful. Now, Judith, I know that you have an upcoming series of lectures that you're doing at NORWAC, which is later on this month. Can you tell us a bit about that, please? I'll be giving a... a, a a virtual workshop at Norwalk on uh, reading medical astrology charts, and that will be May 22nd. I'll also be uh, giving a lecture on uh, medical astrology and traditional herbalism at Norwalk, and a lecture on interpreting eclipses at Norwalk. And I will also be on a panel uh, discussing with Dimitra George and Chris Brennan and a few other people as well at Norwalk. So I'd love to see you all at the workshop if you're interested. And um, thank you so much, Michael, too. I, this has been a, a genuine joy. It's our, our first interview together. Mm -hmm. And uh, very much uh, you know, just the best possible questions. And I hope that the audience uh, received uh, the, you know what we wanted to give so thank you and th thank you audience who, out there in, in screen land uh, in, in, in pandemic yes. time and, with you know haircuts yes. And, <laughs> yes thank you thank you so much Judith it's it's truly been an honor for me and I'm going to put all the information for the Norwalk conference down below for people to sign up and I'm also going to put a link to your website which is judithhillastrology.com for people to be able to reach out to you if they like. And also everyone, if you are interested in signing up for the upcoming natal astrology course that will be hosted by Judith Hill and myself, please do feel free to connect with me. I will put all the information down below. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. And as Judith Hill would want you to do, please continue to dedicate yourself to a life of excellence through your astrological craft because the world needs more excellent astrologers. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful one and be well.